Good morning once again. I see a few people that I don't know if I've met you yet. Um, if you're joining us for one of the first few times, thank you for joining us. My name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's just an honor and a privilege to be here with you all. Um, you know, we love community time, and I just want to encourage you. If you've been here for more than a couple weeks, you're now in, and so that means when you see a new face, go get them. Welcome them in. Make sure they feel that they are seen here. We're just so grateful. Um, but we'll always give you those fun, fun little conversations. We are in a conversation as a church called Seek Out Belonging. Seek Out Belonging, and this is the third conversation. Um, and so you can go back and listen on YouTube or on the podcast, uh, the previous sermons. And I put this uh, sermon illustration from last week of my crock pot, my microwave, and my pressure cooker. I'm not going to say anything more about that. You'll have to go listen to it. Otherwise, just be confused as to why there are appliances on the stage. Um, when we have this conversation, we're realizing belonging is a real challenge in our world today. Belonging is something that's challenging for us because I think you could suggest that we've been more connected right now, we're more connected than any humans have been in history, yet belonging is at an all-time low. We're talking about loneliness as an epidemic these days. And so this is an important question. And so as we jump in today, I'm going to start with kind of a, a question that's going to seem random, but you know me, it's going to eventually make sense, kind of. So I, this is my first question. Okay. Have you heard people generously give out marriage advice, whether or not they're being asked? Okay. So I've noticed this but before I was married. It doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. You overhear this. I remember being a kid and hearing people give out marriage advice, like, here it is, as though being married is not the hardest thing you do, which it is. So... <laughs> I, I just think this is interesting. So I was thinking through, what are the, the top three most common pieces of marriage advice that I've heard over the years? You might have a different list, but this is mine. Tell me if, if you've seen this, okay? So the first one is, you don't just marry the person, you marry their family too. It's true. It's, it's an <laughs> actual thing. Number two, don't go to bed angry. Who's heard this one? This is terrible <laughs> advice. This is really bad advice. Thank you. Somebody's really confused. I just, what I'm trying to suggest is that there's times when your whole brain is not online anymore and your reptile brain is trying to have a conversation about something important, you maybe need to go to bed <laughs> and enter into the conversation the next day because you love the person. You know, like take a nap, at least a nap maybe. I'm just saying you can, you can disagree with me, but I don't think this is great advice. The third one, you don't know the person you're going to marry because they're going to change. Some version of that one. Have you heard that? This is true. I think this one's true. There's a catch. The things you hope are going to change? <laughs> probably not going to change until death you part. That's the unfortunate reality of that one. So I just think this is like the, the three most common. And I was thinking about this and I was like, I think this is some of the same advice that we could give to each other when it comes to trying to belong in community of Jesus followers. Okay, just go with me on this. You know, you don't just get Jesus, you get his whole family. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The second one, like, it's, I think, a kind of a Bible verse taken out of context, the whole don't go to bed angry thing. Again, in community, reptiles, it's not going to work. You got to get the whole brain back online, take a nap. That's just my opinion. Third, you don't know, I mean, community is going to change. People grow and people change. And so just like in a marriage where there's two people and they grow and change, just add more people and more change, right? And change is so hard. It's so challenging for almost all of us. Even the people who like change, it's still hard. <laughs> but it's good when change is you joining in what God's doing in the world and when you're le being led by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't make it easy. And then there's some changes that are just really hard that you didn't ask for and that you weren't hoping for. And so I just think when we think about this, we have to recognize that seeking out belonging is going to be a lifelong thing. It's not something that after August, as to this conversation's over, we just say, period, at the end of that, seeking out belonging. It's seek out belonging in your life, dot, 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 forever. Until Jesus returns, we've talked about this, and he makes the wrong things right, and he makes all things new and restores all the things. It's only then that we will experience the fullest, most true sense of belonging that we long for. But until then, these glimpses of belonging in our lives, they carry us through and they give us hope for the future when we point to the future of who God is and what God's doing. And so we 
we're looking for these glimpses as we seek out belonging. So the first two weeks we looked at this image of the body of Christ. We're looking at kind of images in the New Testament in the letters to the churches of what it looks like to belong. And so we talked about the body of Christ for a couple weeks. And today we're going to look at the image of the family of God. The family of God. And there's many places in scripture that we could go to to turn and, and see this idea of the, the church, the community, the people of God as a family representing the, the, the Jesus followers coming together in that community. So today we're going to choose Galatians 3 of all the places we could go. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Galatians 3, and um, uh, we're going to look at some specific verses. Um, before I give you kind of the context of Galatians, I just want to name something. I want to name that for most of us, there is a lot of emotions that come with the idea of family, like a wide array of them, right? So much joy, so many great experiences, and some really, really tough things, and everything in between the messy middle. That's what family means to most of us, and it can be painful and hard. And so it is with belonging and community, with people. There's just joy and amazing experiences and then things that are really hard and messy and everything in between, and that is where we find ourselves. So let's be okay with holding that tension in this conversation. It's okay to hold on to that because it's real. But I want to give you one piece of encouragement. The family of God has something that holds it together that is very unique and very special. The family of God has something that holds it together that can lead us through even the most difficult moments as a family, okay? I, I think that this passage we look at today is going to give us a really strong clue. What is it about the family of God that can overcome even the most challenging seasons? Wonder about that with me. So Galatians 3. Let me just set this up for you. Galatians is a letter written to the church in Galatia by a leader of the early church named Paul. And he's writing to them because there's a lot going on in their community and we won't be able to talk about all of it, but I want to name the overarching struggle that they're facing. The overarching struggle, like most churches in the first century, was two different groups of people that were very different trying to come together as one. All right? We're talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Very quick description. The Jews, this ethnically group of people that have Hebrews, and their story is the story that we see in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. They had been chosen by God. Why? To be a blessing to the whole world. Gentiles, that represents everybody who's not ethnically Jewish at that time. The whole world, right? So here they are, these two groups of people. And the biggest battle being faced in the church in Galatia at this time is whether or not the Gentiles in this Jesus movement needed to observe some of the same practices that the Jewish people in the, in the Jesus movement had historically been practicing. Culturally, this is all coming together. These practices had come from the law found in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, also what we might call the Torah. And these things were, just for example, things like eating kosher or eating a certain way. Um, things like purity rituals and laws and ways in which you need to, to wash your hands and things like that. And then um, circumcision which was one that they were fighting about a lot. There's a lot of division. And you can imagine how this challenged what it meant to belong in community. Because is there things that you have to do to belong or not? And does that mean we have to give up our culture or not? And there was a lot at stake if the Gentiles were going to have to make such huge cultural changes. Especially for the adult men. And I, I mean, we think about this and we get ourselves into this spot thinking that here we are in 2023 and, and the church is more divided today than ever, right? It's so challenging. There's no way to overcome the differences. But what I want to say is it's a tale as old as time. In the first century, some of these differences felt insurmountable to them. So Paul is writing to encourage them that these divisions can be overcome. They can find a way forward. And they are all family because... They are children of God. So today we're going to zoom in on just four verses in Galatians 3. Um, the, whole, the whole letter, you can hear Paul's passion for this, but I'm just going to zoom in on verse 26 through 29. This is what it says. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, no, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, or in Abraham's family, and heirs according to the promise. Let's just go verse by verse pretty quickly. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Remember, they're fighting about what do you need to do to belong in the family of God. 
But what makes them a child of God is trusting what God did for them through Jesus. Not these efforts, right? Not the practices that had come from the Torah. That's not how you earned your way into belonging. Belonging in the family is by trusting in Jesus, not getting all the laws and all the rules correct, which was impossible. And everyone knew that. Even if you were trying, it was impossible. Verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So you see these two images, right, of baptism, going down into the water, being immersed, and then this idea of clothes or being covered and, and immersed. When people trust in Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. When people trust in Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. His life, his death, and his resurrection becomes theirs. And that's what the practice of baptism is all about. There's a great group of people getting baptized next week. I'm so excited. This idea of their identifying that their life is now true the way that Jesus is true. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2. I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me. The life I now live is by faith in Jesus who loves me and who gave up his life for me. Verse 28, this is, the, this is kind of the truth bomb for them. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. This oneness that Paul is explaining here would have sounded so radical. It would have just been so radical. This idea that Jesus sees everyone as equal in a world that emphasized hierarchy and status, that would have been just mind-blowing to them. Paul is saying God's blessing can come to all people, regardless of their ethnicity, their social status, or their gender, and that would have blown people's minds. And let's be honest, it's still pretty countercultural for us, isn't it? We still slip into that hierarchy all the time, and it's an uphill thing to live into this radical reality of what Paul is describing. But please don't read this, this idea of oneness, to mean that there were no differences in these groups of people. There's differences. Or that oneness means sameness. Oneness does not mean sameness. That's key. Let me give you an example. Uh, Messianic Jewish pastor Mark Kinzer, this is what he put, he wrote, kind of talking specifically about the ethnic part. The witness to the world that the Messiah reconciles or brings together Jews and Gentiles requires them not to suppress their Jewish or Gentile identity, but to maintain their identities while relating to each other in love and thus manifesting unity. Back then, as it is today, this is the witness to a watching world. Not that people choose sameness, but that they can bring their whole self and they find not everybody being the same and uniformity, but unity and diversity. Final verse, verse 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in Galatians chapter 4, as Paul continues on, he uses the phrase adoption to sonship. Adoption to sonship. Adoption in the first century, in many ways, was very different than how we experience it now. But one way that it was similar, I won't, I won't get into all that, but one way that it's similar to today is that when adoption happened, when a person or a persons joined a family, that was a permanent covenant. You don't go back. You are becoming a part of that family, officially and in every way. So that was true in the first century as well. So that's pretty important, what Paul is saying, and we shouldn't miss that. But then he uses the word sonship very intentionally. The, the, in that culture, in the first century, the firstborn sons were the heirs, right? The heirs of the state, of whatever the family had, of the authority over all the things of the family. And so the firstborn sons were the ones that were to receive everything. So take this in. Paul is saying that everyone who belongs to Christ in the family, everyone, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, male and female, are like firstborn son heirs. All of them. In God's eyes, everyone is the firstborn son who inherits everything the family has and the status that everybody wants. Because of Jesus being the firstborn who takes all the, right? Because of being what's true of Jesus is true of everybody else. In God's family, everyone has a position of honor. That's God's heart. And treating each other with that honor is expected in the family. Last week, I summed up this, this in this helpful term, mutuality, a word not from scripture, but I think a way that describes today what Paul was going for. A reciprocal or shared relationship or interaction between two or more parties that often implies that there's a sense of mutual benefit, cooperation, or interdependence in the relationship. We can learn from each other, even though we're different. 
It's not one person has something for someone else, but that there's a reciprocity there. When I think about my life, I, one of the things as I was just preparing, I felt so grateful because my family really modeled mutuality for me. My mom's sitting here in the, in the front row here, and I just, I'm so grateful, mom, for that. There was just a very clear display of what that looked like in our family, but also beyond our family. And I think about how I was born into a family with lots of aunties and uncles, which was awesome. But my family had a very distinct family of God experience where I had aunties and uncles from all over the world, from all different ethnic backgrounds. I got to travel the world. That's so rare, right? Such a huge privilege. And I think about how I had aunties and uncles from Taiwan and Argentina and Africa and all these different places in the world. What a privilege. That is so rare. And I'm so grateful for that. It really shaped me in a lot of different ways. And so I want to share a story about one of my surrogate aunties who I was very close to. I'm still connected with her today. My auntie Susan, who is from India. Look how cute we all are. My, my little brother, he's just looking scared there. <laughs> he's just looking at me like, what is she doing? Um, but but I, this is my auntie Susan, and this is the thing. She was in the waiting room the day I was born. So I have no memory of life without her in my life. But I do have a very distinct memory, and it's a tough one, um, from when I was about maybe four, probably had just turned five. Auntie Susan was with us and some of our extended family that I was a part of by birth, so my extended family, and she was with us. She was with us in, almost all the time. And one of my relatives that I had at that point spent pretty little time with uh, decided to, I mean, she was noticing that little Steph, five-year-old Steph, didn't see a difference between her birth aunties and uncles and her surrogate aunties and uncles. And at that time, she decided to take it upon herself to let me know what it meant to have real aunties and uncles and, and aunties and uncles that were not your actual aunties and uncles. And I, I'm telling you, this is one of those memories that I can't ever forget. It's seared into my mind. And she came up to me and she said, my, my family member, Auntie Susan isn't your real auntie. Look, I'll show you. And then she grabbed my little five-year-old arm and she brought it next to Susan's arm and she said, see? See how her skin color is different than yours? That's how you know she's not in your real family. And it was devastating. Susan was so embarrassed. And I pretty much reacted the way some of you who know me might react and said, that's not true, she is my real auntie. <laughs> and you know what? I still to this day, like she is my family. That's real. And I, I don't tell you this story to disparage my family member because I'll tell you this, I saw some real healing as I became an adult with that family member. I saw a real softening of someone's heart. They were coming from a defensive place. That wasn't okay. But when I look back on this, I, I tell the story because this is what the enemy does, right? This is how the enemy hardens hearts and gets us defensive and tells us lies. I believe my understanding of the spiritual realm is that there is an enemy that is speaking lies to us. Things that are not true about who you are and who God is and who other people are. And some of these lies, it's, it's these whispers in our minds like, you can't belong here. You're, you're too different. Belonging is just for extroverts. You two are introverted. It's a lie. Belonging, you know, you can't belong here, the enemy says. You can't bring your full self. You're too much. You're not enough. That's not from God. The enemy says you can't belong here. You don't make the same amount of money. You're not educated in the same way. Look at your skin. Look at your hair. Look at your food. You're too different. You don't belong here. That's a lie from the enemy. It's not true. But it's told to us. And it manifests in stories like that encounter that I had with my family member. And so you can see how these same lies were spoken 2,000 years ago to the church in Galatia, just like they're spoken to us today. And that's why Paul, I think, is so adamant. I imagine he's kind of like, you know, even though he's writing, he's just like, Seriously, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. I think I have to imagine he was just desperately pleading with them. Do we see how radical this is? Then and now? Do we see how this is just absolutely necessary that we have an empowerment from the Holy Spirit to do this? Even for a day? That's my experience. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul makes it clear there is only one way that this kind of family can be experienced. He says, if you stay in step with the Spirit. 
to let the spirit of Jesus be in you and work through you. Jesus' transforming presence through the spirit is key. I wish it could be something like just do this, these three things and then you'll have it. It'll be good. It's not though. It's a daily, I call it a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. I'm choosing to depend on how the Spirit softens my heart and gives me words to say and helps me know when to not say those words. And Paul has a very distinct description for what this is. When, when you live in dependence on the Spirit, Jesus' life becomes yours and it looks like what Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit. That's what will come out of your life. God wants to reproduce this in God's family so that they become people of love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. But it's not automatic. That is not a try harder list. Trust me. That is not a try harder list. That's a surrender more list. It's not something that's gonna be natural. We have to choose to live by the Spirit and stay in step with the Spirit. And what's cool is that Jesus reshapes our minds and hearts. And sometimes it even gets a little bit easier because we're being formed to be people who allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. And so this description here, this is the new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. This is the vision God has for the world. Earlier I said the, the family of God has something that holds it together, that can lead, us through even the most difficult moments as a family? What, what is it? What is, the, what is it about the family of God that can overcome even the most challenging seasons? The clue is right there in chapter, the, the last verse of chapter 3, verse 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So there's two things. If you belong to Christ, there's our word belong. Two things. First, your family, right? You, you're in Abraham's family. You're in, the, in a part of the family. We're spiritually related in community. But we're not an ordinary family. This family has our heirs according to the promise. What's the promise? What's the promise that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12? To be a blessing to the whole world. So if you're in Abraham's family now, that's your purpose too. That's it. You can't have one or the other, right? You can't be just in this sense of relationship or in the sense of responsibility. It's both. All the families on earth would be blessed. So if we're in the family, then we inherit the purpose, right? We're sons and daughters in relationship, and we are heirs of the responsibility. And there's days when we just want to do one of them, but they go together. And here's the truth. Belonging is not the end, but a means to God's end. It's the thing that God is doing. We're sons and daughters, but also heirs of the promise. It's not merely a family for the sake of being a family, but a family on mission. The mission to join in what God's doing and to love and bless the world. Look at this diagram that I made for you. Do you see how it's in the intersection of community and calling that God's family on mission is? It's in the intersection of relationship and responsibility. We're sons and daughters, but we're also heirs, firstborn sons, with all the responsibilities and the roles empowered by the Holy Spirit, only because of what Jesus has done. God's family on mission. So what is it about the family of God that can overcome even the most challenging seasons? It's purpose. It's purpose. And what I love is that, um, here's our purpose, I'll just tell you what, what, I, what I think, sum it up. God's family on mission to love the world in the name of Jesus, to join in what God's doing, right? To be a part of wrong things made, right? And to be people who, who point people to Jesus' love so they too can experience belonging in God's family, right? We join in what God's doing, making wrong things right, being a part of, of all of the restoration as we wait for Jesus to restore all things. And then we point people to Jesus' love so that they can experience belonging too. Here's what I love. I love when sociology and anthropology confirms what we see in who God created us to be, okay? And this is an example. Sociologists have found time and time again that the deepest differences can be overcome when you have a common purpose. That the deepest things can be overcome when you have a common purpose or a common mission. And that's the thing that brings people together more than anything else across differences. And so that's why when I have been on the opposite side of the world, I have met people who are followers of Jesus and they feel like family right away. Why? Because we have the same purpose. But they're very different than me. They're very different than me. We share a purpose as God's family on mission to love the world in the name of Jesus. 
That's why I would say many of us, we have trusted friendships and relationships with other churches and communities here in the Twin Cities. I think about so many pastors of all different ethnic backgrounds and ages of different denominations. When we say, hey, there is only one church of Jesus. It just meets in different locations. We have a shared purpose. It's okay that we have different local churches. There's reasons for that. But at the end of the day, we are a part of God's family because we share a purpose together. This is why Mill City Church can live out our mission to love our community in the name of Jesus. If you're just joining us, let me tell you something about us. We are a group that spans significantly every living generation. We are a group of people who think differently, who vote differently, who have different thoughts about a lot of different stuff. We are increasingly diverse in our cultural and ethnic background. And if we're going to move forward together, it's because we're going to remember that we have a shared purpose. Not because we all think the same thing or have the same culture or do the same stuff. All those differences, they don't make us weaker. They strengthen us. Right? They strengthen us. The church in the Twin Cities is strengthened with the unity and diversity. The church is strengthened. It matures us. And you know what else differences do? They help you come down to the thing that matters the most. Centering on who Jesus is and what he's done. Everything else, awesome conversations. But at the end of the day, that's the, that's the main thing, isn't it? And those differences help us remember that while we're having these other good conversations. We share a purpose. This, the reason the family of God can overcome even the most challenging seasons is because there's a purpose bigger than the family itself. Belonging is not merely for our sake, but for the sake of the world. Belonging is not merely for our sake, but the sake of the world. God's family on mission to love the world in the name of Jesus. I, I really don't want to be negative Nancy up here, okay? I'm so sorry if someone's named Nancy. That's, that was a bummer for you. <laughs> I love Nancys. Um, we, we are in a world that trains us for individualism. We are in a world that trains us for self-reliance. We are in a world that teaches us that difference is a threat, right? Not something that, it's something that separates us. It, we're in a world that tells us we're supposed to separate into factions, not come together as families. And, and I just bring that up to say that that's why keeping the purpose at the core is so important. Jesus invited us to live a different way. As a family where anyone can experience belonging. And God's family is open to anyone who wants to seek after Jesus and trust him and join his mission of love. The rest can be wrestled with. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying God's family is open to anyone who will seek after Jesus, trust him, and join the mission of love. But just like the church in Galatia, there's a wrestle, right? Because they're going, well, what about this? What about, these, what about our culture? What about these things? Isn't that what makes you a part of the family? And God's family is not that. It's one that's open to anyone who will seek after Jesus, trust him, and join the mission of love. So I, I know that was a lot of, like, kind of big picture stuff. I'm just going to give some practical things as takeaways. Because I know some of you, that's the way you're wired. And that's great. Um, I'm, I'm definitely that way, too. So let's just talk from those four verses. The first thing that comes to the surface for me, if you're going to be clothed with Christ, is to imitate Jesus. Because everything else we're imitating without thinking. Imitate Jesus. When we live in the Spirit, we've clothed ourselves with Christ. What's true of Jesus is true of us. When it comes to belonging, we have a great teacher in Jesus. When we look at the stories about Jesus, when we see all these ways, we can imitate so many ways. Who has seen this meme on the internet? Nobody talks about Jesus' miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. <laughs> right? Dudes, like dudes too. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's weird because it's kind of like, it's that hard that we're making jokes about it. <laughs> but look at Jesus' life. That didn't happen by accident. And I know we don't have the same life as Jesus, like walking around in the sandals and stuff. But the reality is, Look at what we learn from him. Jesus is so intentional with everyone he encounters, isn't he? And as, as far as I see the story, he's on a mission, but at least how I read the stories, he's never in like a hurried frenzy like so many of us find ourselves in. He's fully present where he is. He has a life oriented towards his relationship with the Father, his up relationship with the Father, his in relationship with his community, those closest to him and beyond, and then out towards these crowds and these people who need to experience healing and restoration and wrong things made right and be welcomed into the family, right? His up, in, and out. 
Maybe you have heard Jesus' relationships uh, defined by those closest to him as the three, the 12, the 72, and the crowds. Have you heard that? Like the three, the 12, the 72, and then the crowds. And I just think it's one of the coolest things, again, that Jesus modeled something that sociologists and anthropologists actually study all the time. It's called proxemics. Proxemics, you can look it up. Proxemics is the study of how space is used in human interactions, okay? Uh, this uh, anthropologist, Edward Hall, he coined, coined this word way back in the 1960s, and it classified these four major proxemic zones, okay? So you see this on this diagram here. You see that there is the intimate space, the two to four, the personal space, five to 12, social space, 20 to 50, and then public space when it's kind of 70 and beyond, and there's some like fuzziness in between them. The three, the 12, the 72, and beyond, right? Like Jesus is modeling what we were wired to experience. And what the sociologists have done is said, you know, in these different spaces, actually different cultures, people are different, like how close they stand when they're talking and things like that. But what we've also seen is that relational health happens when we seek belonging in all four of these zones. And that's important because sometimes we get ourselves into thinking we feel belonging only in the intimate space or only in the personal space, but actually we can experience belonging in all four. And you can see how this ap applies to a, a local church community or other communities you might be a part of. It's good to say, I belong here, even though I have no idea what all these people's names are. Like that's a good thing for us and how we're wired. That's okay, as long as you've got the smaller space where it's like, hey, there's, I don't know all these people's names, but I can get some more names because there's maybe the social space size and I can find some people who have some common interests and some people who are very different and everything in between. The hardest kind of sociological reality is something that I, I wrestle with this all the time, and that is that when it comes to the personal space and the intimate space, these are not things that can be structured for you. You can be in a group that size, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if, you just, if we just picked eight people, you're not gonna have like, the intimacy and the belonging right away, right? If you just put three people in a room, that's not gonna do it. In fact, sociologists say it's in the public space and the social space that organic interactions happen and people start to develop those personal space and intimate space, but that means some real seeking on, belong of those, on those people, seeking that belonging, right? And that's hard, so I, I told you this last week, but in the fall, we always have so many ways to connect. We have so many awesome ways. There are all these different sizes. That's good. But there is nothing you can sign up for that is going to give you belonging. But every single space that you're in, you can seek out belonging. And it just means that that next step has to happen. Sign up for the things. It'll be great. But like the next step has to happen. You've got to say, all right, I'm going to see if this person wants to do lunch, get the phone numbers. I know we got the kids. I know this is a different life stage. Whatever the barriers are, we have to do it. Nobody can do it for us. We have to take those steps. And I'm telling you, they're hard. I, I, it is. When you think about this, you know, these different spaces, I just want to offer the question to you. What does belonging look like for you in these four kind of sociological spaces right now? Maybe one of them feels like an area of focus right now. So you might be thinking about that in different ways, and everybody's different. That's why we need to be so patient with each other. Because somebody might be saying, I'm looking for this, and someone's looking for that, and we need to trust the Holy Spirit to bring people together in these different ways. But we've got to let go of the idea that there's a quick fix for it, or a silver bullet, because it's just not how we're wired. And so please, join the, the things, but like, if we don't bring ourselves to seek belonging, it's not gonna happen. I wanna point out the, the intimate space. This is something that we're noticing in culture uh, less and less people have these people. I call them our 2 a.m. friends. These are the people that you'd call at 2 o'clock in the morning if you needed to call them. And the, the thing about life is that there are 2 a.m. phone calls, aren't there? And so if you're not sure who those 2 a.m. friends are right now in your life, because sometimes it shifts and that's hard, but it happens, I wonder about that. Who is that? Pray about that. Let God bring that to the surface. Who are those people? And maybe you need to talk to them about it. Is that a little bit awkward? Yeah, I call it a friendship DTR, defining the relationship. Um, it can be weird if someone's like, actually, I don't have capacity to be a 2 a.m. friend. At least you know, but we have to have perseverance and to seek that out. And I'm not trying to say that it's easy to be that vulnerable, but vulnerability is required for it to happen. Jesus modeled this. Just two more quick things. Practice mutuality. We talked about it last week, too. Our default is often going to be seeing differences as a problem that has to be overcome instead of a gift to be unpacked. Like we approach the differences to say, oh boy, we got to overcome these differences instead of, wow, we should unpack these differences. We've got so much to learn about each other. Mutuality is a choice. 
to remind ourselves in God's eyes we are all equal siblings. We might need to do some mindset shifting. Right? If you notice that your brain is going to, oh man, these are really different. I don't know what to talk to them about. I don't know what to ask. This person's got a lot of differences than me. That's okay, but let's shift our minds to say, what if this is something I get to open up and explore and understand and become somebody who is more deep and mature because of it? I think those mindset shifts really matter. And so in a couple weeks, Pastor Ashish is going to dig into that a little bit more. Finally, number three, finally, refocus on purpose. That's the reason that the family of God can overcome even the most challenging seasons. It's because there's a purpose bigger than the family itself. And, and, and that's that purpose that we have, to be a part of God's family on mission, to join in what God's doing, to be people who point to Jesus' love so other people can experience belonging in God's family. So when we feel the stretch that comes from being part of a family that's diverse, refocus on purpose. When we feel like our preferences are being sacrificed, refocus on purpose. When we notice our defenses rising, when we disagree, that's okay, but let's refocus on purpose. When we feel overwhelmed by the weight of the problems of the world and the church and belonging and all the things, refocus on purpose. Because Jesus' purpose is restoration. And that's happening right now in our midst. We've seen it. God is restoring things. It's not fully restored yet, right? But we seek after these glimpses of belonging and purpose all around us in the kingdom of God through Jesus. And we look forward to the hope of the complete restoration. As, we were, as I was just thinking about how to close today, something came to mind. I'm going to invite the worship team up. I just felt this sense that I was supposed to commission you, like to send you into this season of of looking, seeking out belonging and purpose as we continue the conversation. So if you're willing to let me commission you, that'd be awesome. So um, if you're able to stand, that'd be great if you can, if you don't, you don't have to. And I just want to pray a prayer of commissioning over you before we go into our time of, of communion and our time of worship. So whatever posture of re receiving works for you, let me pray this over you. May you receive empowerment from the Holy Spirit that lives in you to imitate Jesus, to practice mutuality, and to refocus on purpose. I commission you in the name of Jesus to seek out belonging in a world forming you towards self-reliance. May you imitate Jesus as he showed us the fruits of his spirit and promises to empower us by his spirit. I commission you to practice mutuality in a world defined by division. May the Spirit of God empower you to be a bridge builder and one who unpacks the gift of diversity with awe of the creative creator. I commission you to do the work of refocusing on purpose in a world that tells us our focus is self-fulfillment. May you experience the rich depth of community found in being part of a family with a purpose. God's family on mission to love the world in Jesus' name. Amen.